before all of you guys get up and leave. It's not that ooey gooey squishy kind of love that we're going to talk about today. So just hang in there with me and uh, see where we go. Last week, uh, John, our senior pastor down in Austin, he shared that we are going to be celebrating our 20th anniversary as a church on September 23rd. And it's, that's pretty cool. It's actually our sixth year as a campus of Gateway and actually the eighth year that we've been connected to Gateway. But this, this celebration in September, it'll be a time to recognize all that God has done in you and through you, and it, it will also serve as an opportunity to kind of relaunch our church into a, a new era. You know, a new era of bringing life and freedom to those in Branson. And so the theme is love everybody life by life. It's simply God's plan for changing the world. And it's really been the fuel of who we are for those last 20 years. And then it's meant to be our marching orders for the next 20 years. But before we can love everyone, we have to understand what love is. You know, uh, we have all these mixed meanings about love. We throw the word love around so much that we tell people we love them in one breath, and in that same breath we follow it up with, and I love my shoes. I, you know, I can say in one breath how much I love my wife Amy, and in the same breath, say how much I love chocolate chip cookies, because I really do love chocolate chip cookies, but I love my wife like I love cookies. I mean, we use the word on love on everything. Love can be such a challenge to define because of so many different meanings. And often we associate love at the level of how we experience it. You know, love can be uh, something that involves personal affection, sexual attraction, um, admiration, brotherly loyalty, genuine concern, or even a worshipful adoration. One of the confusions with the word love is that it has both a noun meaning and a verb meaning. So in, uh, the noun meaning of love would look like this, an intense feeling of deep affection, like their love for their country. The verb meaning of love would be to feel a deep romantic or sexual attach, attachment to someone, such as, do you love me? And so to an accurately answer the question, what is love, and to fully understand love, we need to go to the origin of love. And the Bible tells us that love originates in God. If you didn't know, the Bible is actually broken up into an Old Testament and a New Testament, consisting of 66 books. And the Old Testament of the Bible is about life on earth before Jesus was here, and the New Testament of the Bible is about life on earth after Jesus came here. And there's these separate books in the Bible with chapters and verses, and they're really just eyewitness accounts of world history. And if you don't have a Bible, we have free, easy-to-read Bibles over here at our connection counter that you can grab after church. You can take it with you. It's yours to keep. Um, if you don't like carrying around a book, you can download our Gateway Branson app, and there's a Bible in there that you can use. If you don't have a Bible, it's not a big deal. We'll put all the verses up on the screen for you today. But did you know that the word love was never intended to be used like we use it in our English language? See, the, the languages in which the Bible was written, Hebrew and Greek, are more precise in that they utilize different words for different types of love. So the ancient languages differentiate among like a sexual love, a brotherly love, a family love, or the kind of love that God has for us and that we may have for God. There's a Hebrew word called dod, 
and the Greek word is euros, they are the words used to indicate a sexual love, you know, a passion love. And in fact, um, there's actually a PG-13 book in the Old Testament of the Bible called Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. And, and here, let me just, this is how this book starts out. Let me read you uh, the first couple of verses in there. So in Song of Songs, verse 2 through 4, Kiss me and kiss me again, for your love is sweeter than wine. How fragrant, fragrant your cologne. Your name is like its spreading fragrance. No wonder all the young women love you. Take me with you. Come, let's run. The king has brought me into his bedroom. All right, that's just the start of that book, right? And you, so you can see by just those verses right there that this kind of love, this dode love or this euros kind of love, it's all around passion and sex. You know, when we think of the Bible, we don't think about that being in the Bible, but it's there. Now, there's a second type of love that the Greeks and the Hebrews talk about in the Bible, and it's this brotherly love or this love that you have for a friend or that a friend may have for you. And it, it exists no matter if the friend is a boy or a girl or whatever. It's just a friendship kind of love. There's no sexual connotation. Um, the Hebrew word for this kind of love is ahava. And the Greek word for this kind of brotherly love is phileo. And it can also be used to describe like the love a person has for their country, such as when someone says, I love my country. Not to be confused with when Yakov Smirnov says, what a country! Not that kind of love. It's the, it's the uh, I love my country. So the Bible talks about this kind of love in the New Testament of the Bible in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 1. Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. And in, and in the New Testament book of Romans chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good, love each other with genuine affection, and take delight in honoring each other. But the kind of love that we need to understand to have the ability to love everyone life by life is the kind of love that God demonstrates to us. The Hebrew word for this kind of love, love is hesed, and it is often translated as a steadfast love or a loving kindness. Hesed is the kind of love that God shows us when he, he shows us that he will never give up on us, no matter how much we continue to mess up. The Greek translation of this kind of love is the word agape. Agape love is similar to hesed love in that it's steadfast regardless of its circumstances. But agape love is the kind of love we are to have for God in fulfillment of the greatest commandment found in the New Testament book of Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. When Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? He replies, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. See, the essence of agape love is goodwill, well-meaning kindness, and the willful delight in the object of love. Unlike our English word love, agape is not used to refer to romantic or sexual love, and it doesn't refer to a brotherly love or a close friendship. Agape love involves faithfulness, commitment, an act of obedience. See, Jesus wants to instill agape love in his followers so that we may serve others. Agape love is beautifully described in the Bible. In the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7, this is the best definition of agape love. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. 
It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith. It is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. See, agape is used to describe the love that is of God and from God. See, God's very nature is love because God is love. Everything that God does flows from his love. And the type of love that characterizes God is not that sappy, sentimental feeling uh, that is so often portrayed, right, that we see on TV and movies. See, God's love is because it's his nature. And that's the way he expresses his being. He loves the unlovable. He loves the unlovely. And not because uh, we deserve to be loved, It's not because we do things right and and we earn his love. It's not because we possess this this character of excellence. It's because it's his nature. And to be true to his nature, he has to love us. See, agape love is always shown by what it does. God's love was displayed most clearly at the cross when he sent his only son, Jesus, to die for you and me so that we could be forgiven of all our wrongs, all our mistakes from our past, from our present, and even the the future wrongs that we haven't yet committed, but will. See, the Bible says we are the undeserving recipients of God's lavish agape love in the New Testament book of Romans, chapter five. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners, while we were still screwing up, he sent his son to die for you and for me. I don't know how many of you have kids. I've got six of them, and I love you guys, but I can't see me sending any of my kids to die for you. Um, and, and it's just a, such a powerful love that he would do that. You know, we don't deserve such a sacrifice. But God's agape love is a love that's unmerited. It's gracious. And it's constantly seeking the benefit of the ones he loves. He loves you so much. He wants you to benefit so much that he gave his only son for you. And see, that's why we are to love others. We are to love them with that same agape love whether they are followers of Jesus or our bitter enemy. See, agape love, as modeled by Jesus, it's not based on a feeling. It is this determined act of will, this joyful resolve to put other people's needs in front of ours. Agape love uh, does not come to us naturally. You know, because of our brokenness, we are incapable of producing such a love on our own. If we are to love as God loves, that, that love, that agape love, it can only come from the source. I, I remember um, a few years back before I was uh, following Jesus, um, we'd go through the drive through Amy and I, and... and um, some fast food joint, you know, and, and we get up there to hand them the money. And Amy would ask something like, uh, how's your day going? And man, the floodgates of conversation would open. And I'd be like telling her, Amy, you just, you don't make eye contact. You just hand them the money and then you just go. Otherwise we're stuck in the drive through 20 minutes with this conversation, but she would never learn. And the reason she wouldn't listen to to me saying that is because she had this agape love for others, and I didn't have it yet. But once I found it, I found that I engaged in those conversations just as much. And because of God's agape love toward us, we are able to have that same agape love toward others. So what does it look like for us to be able to do this? How, how can we have this agape kind of love 
to be able to love everyone life by life? What are some things that we need to do to help us get there? So I've put together five things. The first is pray. Sometimes love looks like praying for someone. John, uh, last week, he challenged us to identify 20 people in our life that we know who we could begin praying for. Who are those 20 people that we would like to invite to experience God's love? And once we have that, start praying for them. And you might be saying, well, why pray? Or how do I pray? And that's a great question. I'm glad you asked. Uh, Back in June, we did a series on why pray. And if you go to our Gateway Branson website, you can actually go back and, and watch those messages over again that will give you instructions on not only why to pray, but how to pray and how to pray for somebody else. See, what God does in somebody's life, uh, that's, that's the most important thing. And when we begin to pray for them as God's working in their life, we're kind of in a partnership. We're in a, our hearts become aligned with God. And, and, and you get to see just some amazing things happen in people's lives. So the second thing that we need to do is connect. One of the things that you will see all throughout the Bible is that the love of God was shared when people connected to one another on a relational level. They shared a meal together, or they had a conversation with one another. They had some interaction where they got to know each other. So for you, love may look like spending time with another person by taking them out to coffee, inviting them to go uh, hang out, go to a movie, doing something. Somehow, of expressing that you care for them in the form of spending quality time with them. Most of the time before we can help somebody or before somebody will even allow us into their life to help them, they need to know that we care about them. They need to see uh, God's love in us before they will begin to feel connected to us. One of the things I learned a long time ago is that People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so who can you connect with in a deeper way this week? So the the third thing that we need to do is serve. See, loving everyone life by life might look like an act of service for someone that God puts in your path. You know, it might be a, a gift card or a ride to work, or an errand that you would do uh, for someone else. It it would be like this radical act of generosity that you might do. And God will give you opportunities to practice this thing we call servolution, if you're looking for them. Servolution is a complete and radical change of a person's life caused by simple acts of kindness for the glory of God. Who can you serve this week? Yeah, you know, I, was, I was at Walmart um, last night. I think it was last night. Were we there last night? Yeah, I was at Walmart last night, and I'm tired, it's, it's late, and, and uh, late for me, like nine o'clock. And uh, um, I'm waiting on Amy, she was doing some shopping, and a gentleman uh, comes up to me and he says, hey, could you uh, jumpstart my truck? And I said, sure, where are you at? And he was like, parking lot way over, and, and I really needed to go to the bathroom, and I wanted to get home, and so it was like one of those, but yeah, yeah, I will. I went over there, and it was, a, it was definitely a God opportunity because I got to reconnect with him. He, uh, he used to come to church here, and they moved to Blue Eyes, so he hasn't been back in a while, but it was just an awesome God-inspired moment, and when you look for those opportunities to do that, God will uh, come through for you. He'll put him there. So then the fourth thing to do is invite. See, when we gather as a church body, as a group of people, one of the things that we're trying to do here through our music and our video and our teaching is to put God's love on display. Our goal is that you would feel God's presence, that his, his love, when you walk in, that you would, you would feel that. 
but that it's not just for you. You know, our Sunday morning here is meant to inspire you to be in a place where you can invite someone else to experience that with you as well. That they could experience maybe Jesus for the very first time. So that's why we do church a little differently here. We've stripped out as much of the traditionally churchy stuff uh, that might get in the way of somebody really experiencing or encountering God. And, and so um, that's why it's a great opportunity for you to tell people it's not like church. We, you could even call it a, a Sunday morning gathering. But don't just come to church for yourself. Who else can you share a Sunday morning with? So, so be thinking about that throughout your week. And then speaking of sharing, that's the fifth thing we want to do. We want to share. For all the ways that you can communicate God's love uh, to someone, there's something very, just very important that you can do that really, I believe, is the key to pointing people to Jesus. And that is share your own story about Jesus. How can your story impact somebody else? I believe that people want to know what Jesus has done for you versus what's in the Bible. And I think, I think the first thing is if you will tell people about how Jesus has changed your life, then it's an avenue to open up the Bible for them and learn more about how Jesus can impact them. But it all starts with you sharing your story. God has given us the task as followers of Jesus to bring people back to him. And because of God's agape love through Jesus on the cross, he no longer counts our sins or our mistakes or our wrongs against us. So with every conversation, every prayer, Every act of service, every invitation, every sharing of our story, you and I are ambassadors for Jesus. See, God is making his appeal through us that we speak for Jesus when we plead to our friends and our neighbors to come back to God. So I want to challenge you this week with three questions before we go today. The first is to ask yourself this, am I encountering the agape love of God for myself? If not, we have people that would love to pray for you, that would point you to next steps, that would help you along in your spiritual journey. They will answer any questions you, you might have about God's love, and if they don't know the answer, they'll dive in with you to try to discover those answers. And so today during the music, uh, they'll be on both sides of the room uh, during that music. And you can go over to them and you can just ask them for prayer, just that you can accept or, or feel God's agape love. Second question I'll ask you is, who do I want to encounter the agape love of God for themselves? See, it's not enough for us as followers of Jesus to just experience it for ourselves. Who are the other people in your life, your friends, your neighbors, your, your family, your coworkers who are yet to experience God's agape love? So ask God, who are you putting in my life that I could move toward this and begin to pray for them now Maybe they're part of that 20 that you've identified. The third question I would ask you is, how am I going to let the movement of a God's agape love flow through me to others? What action steps could you begin to take? You know, Thursday night, when we deliver 1,250 meals, it's such a movement of God's love. You can go out and it may be out of your comfort zone, but just by the presence of you knocking on somebody's door and smiling to them and handing them a meal, uh, maybe for the very first time, is an action step of God's agape love. Praying, connecting, inviting, serving, sharing. If nothing else, 
would you invite God to begin giving you opportunities to let that agape love flow through you life by life to other people? Maybe today is the first day that you've decided to let your, yourself experience God's agape love. Maybe today is the first day you've decided to have a relationship with God. If so, I would like to invite you to join me in communion. Communion is a 2,000-year-old practice that the followers of Jesus have passed down from generation to generation. There's a, a piece of bread and a cup of juice, and they are powerful symbols of the body of Jesus that was broken on the cross for us, for you and me, and, and in his blood that was shed, that God gave his only son so that we could experience this love. Actually, this tradition of communion began the Thursday before Easter, before Jesus was crucified. See, taking the, the bread and the cup is a statement that says, I need Jesus to be my savior. And that you are committing to following him and that he is the leader and Lord of your life. It's a very, it, it, communion is actually a very intimate thing between you and Jesus. And so if you're not yet sure about following Jesus, uh, then don't do it yet. Just keep exploring. You know, keep checking out Jesus until you're ready for that. See, communion with Jesus is something that you should take very, very serious. And we take it serious here. That's why we set it up in the back of the room here so that you won't feel any pressure to take it if you're not ready. See, nobody will know if you get up or don't get up and go back there. Um, that way there's, just, there's no pressure on you. And so while the band comes up here to, to play some songs to God and for God and about God, uh, you can get up any time during those songs, and you can go back there and grab that cup of juice and that piece of bread, and, and you can take that communion any time your heart is ready during the, the songs here. You know, um, we're going to sing these songs to God and for God and about God, and you can sit, you can stand, we'll put the words up on the screen, but take this time to really reflect on those things. Who are those 20 people in my life? How can I help them experience God's agape love? And we don't pass an offering bucket here. This is just our gift to you. If Gateway is your church home, we just ask that you would give out of the gratitude of all that God has done for you. We have buckets set up in the back back there. We can do that on your way out. We have giving stations back there. You can do that as well. You can go to our website, and you can actually set up a recurring gift on there uh, at any time so you don't have to try to remember it. Um, but if not, this is just our gift to you. We just, this is our way of expressing God's love is to, to get together every Sunday morning and, and, and have a breakfast together and, and spend this time together listening to some music and, and really honoring God. If you'd like someone to pray with you and for you, like I said earlier, uh, we'll have people over here on the sides that would love to do that. And if during that prayer, you're telling them that, man, this is the first time that I've experienced God's love, or this is the first time I've decided to accept Jesus as my uh, leader in my life, tell them that. Let them pray for you. Let them point you to next steps. And then don't forget, uh, after service, we'll have opportunities over here for baptism packets. But I'll talk more about that in a minute. We'll let the band uh, play some songs for us. And then I'll come back up and close us out in prayer.